So good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, welcome to this very first live event for Learning Letters, the new journal that we're um, hosting and that you can uh, click the QR code just up here, here over my shoulder and go and have a look at the actual journal itself. Um, and we have to deal with Siri talking at me already. So um, my name is uh, Dr. John Kennedy. Um, I am the technical editor at the uh, Learning Letters Journal. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Roberto Martinez Maldonado. Roberto received his PhD in information technologies from the University of Sydney. He's currently a senior lecturer of learning analytics and human computer interaction with the Faculty of Information Technology, and he's the coordinator of the Center for Learning Analytics with Monash University. He's going to talk to us tonight about his recently published paper on human-centered learning analytics, and I'm going to encourage people to use the question and answer um, chat box, Q&A chat rather than the open chat, to drop any questions in as you go, and we'll do our best to answer them as we go. I'm going to hand over to Roberto and let him share his screen and he can lead this conversation. Over to you, Roberto. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. And thank you so much to the editorial team for preparing this. This is a great initiative. I really appreciate it. And it's also great to see so many familiar faces or names in the list as, as we are joining here for a, an hour to discuss about this topic and also to to new people that I'm, I'm really appreciate for, for your time. And I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, so this is um, a piece that I prepare because um, I've been working with a, with a big team and I'm just gonna put their faces here. But before I, I start, um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm connecting from the uh, Bumburum people's land. And I would like to acknowledge that this is uh, the land that has been walked by different ancestors and also ancestors are emerging. And now it's called Melbourne, um, but it has lots of uh, cultural heritage. And uh, also I would like to acknowledge that the work I'm going to talk about is, is not only mine, is is a part of a joint effort. This is uh, my current team. There's more people involved, but this, these are the uh, colleagues and students who have been contributing to human-centered learning analytics and also other colleagues in other institutions like Simon Buckingham Schum, Patricia Santos, Janice Dimitriadis have been also we have been collaborating in organizing different initiatives around human-centered learning analytics. Uh, and oh, first disclaimer that I want I would like to to have an interactive uh, talk rather than just like one channel, but I'm also conscious about the um, number of attendees. So um, depending on how we go, maybe we are going to have a, a chance to interact more verbally. Uh, but in the meantime, if I'm talking or mentioning something, any question emerges, feel free to just put it in the in the Q and A, and then um, I can try to have a look and, and, and incorporate that into um, whatever I'm gonna be, would like to be sharing. Um, and also if you feel like sharing something uh, at the end, we, we can have that interaction. And also another disc disclaimer is like, um, the idea here is in also the purpose of the paper that um, I'm going to be using as a uh, landing source for, for the things and as a structure for the chat is um, the idea is just to inspire curiosity and cultivating that inquiry, um, going beyond learn analytics and start to looking at other areas as well, like design. And, and this is human-centered learning analytics also emerging. O obviously human-centered design is a, it's a big monster. There's lots of uh, knowledge that we can find in different communities, but within the area of learn analytics is relatively new and still is shaping. We don't, we don't know exactly what it is because it requires also lots of wearing multiple hats, lots of areas of expertise. There's lots of things to understand. And um, and also, I know that I, I see so many familiar faces in, in the list uh, at the moment, in the Zoom list. 
of participants, but for those who don't know me, I would like to use this um, slide to introduce myself. This is a piece of art by a Mexican artist, Raul Cruz, but I love it because it represents on the right to Pakal, which is a Mayan uh, king. And on the left, we have the robot, you know, the AI serving to humans, but it's not any human. It has all this cultural background and, and to me, it's very strong. It, it, it taps into the idea and it calls for, for us to understand that if we design AI power tools in education, we need to understand where are we using them? Who are we serving? What are all the, what is the complexities that are involved in that interaction between these robots and, and humans or the AI and humans or learn analytics and, and actual flesh students. Um, and and I'm, by the way, how, how my ancestors are, part of my ancestors are from uh, the Iberic Peninsula and all, also from Mayan. So you just wait for introduce what I'm doing. Um, but I would like to start as well in motivating these challenges of human-centered learn analytics um, by talking about one example of the challenges of designing for someone, right? Like when us men, we, we don't know what, what, is, what is the experience of being a woman, try to debate or design for women, for example, no? that we don't have a clue. So how can we do that? Uh, it's very different to design for someone than designing with someone or, or even the people who are going to be affected by some design decisions to design for themselves. So it's just that language. And I just wanted to bring that because this is something that um, we live it on, the, on our flesh in different ways because um, we have different privilege and we live with different um, in different status of power sometimes as well. So we're going to touch on some of these issues, like bringing them into education, right? And, and this is important because designing for equity and justice is in the language of learning analytics. Um, it was in the call for papers of Black 23 of this year is, is basically and foundational. So this is also responding to that call. And also, uh, I like to bring this piece by um, Dragan Gasevich and his two former students, uh, now amazing researchers and um, fully independent. And, and I like this because it, they talk about very early on that design itself is one of the three pillars of learning analytics. We have educational theory, of course, we have data science and we can unpack all of that, but we also have design. And at least my perception is that we are talking not only about learning design, that's important, of course, but we are talking about design in general, like how to design things, because in the end, that's what we want to do in learning analytics. We want to um, design things for, for people. And I think my screen just turned yellow because it's, it's a bit getting later here. Um, is that also your screens? No, we've still got the nice uh, bright you, you got the nice, daylight. okay, it's just my side. Okay, so I, I kind of- It's just your get... end going to sleep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm fine with that, following that way. Um, and there's another piece that I really like, uh, which is about um, that, that talk is, is by Simon Buckingham Sherman and Simon Unai, um, that they talk about what, what makes this area exciting is that we want to give something to teachers and students, right? And when we start to talk about that, we're talking about interfaces, designing something, designing the closing the feedback loop. Um, however, when we think about that closing the feedback loop, we immediately think potentially about dashboards or some sort of visualization or some sort of interactive boot or, or chatbot or uh, so let's to take for example the dashboards. So um, we have um, we have some systematic literature reviews in the last years where we keep hearing that well dashboards have all these challenges. Sometimes they are not actionable, or um, sometimes they don't consider all these concepts of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Or also teachers may struggle to interact with them for a number of reasons. Um, so so it seems that there's there's a problem there or an opportunity to address. And this has been started to be identified in the literature as well. This is the emerging literature in, in this area of human-centered learning analytics. There was a 
a special issue editorial in JLA some time ago and um, a fantastic webinar by Lisa Wise as well in the solar webinar series. And she talked precisely about designing for versus designing with humans um, and some key papers. So I'm just not gonna go in, on, through this list. Um, I'm happy to, to share the slides as well um, for anyone who is interested in, in, in the list of things that are going on. And there is some um, some other initiatives going on at the moment, like we currently are uh, co-editing with Simon Buckingham Schum, Janis Dimitradis, and Patricia Santos, um, this second special issue on human-centered design for their analytics. Um, and, and, and there are some very interesting topics that are, are important, like bringing these ideas from co-design, participatory design, which are big areas that have their own identities and their own bodies of bodies of uh, literature and knowledge, and and all all the other concepts that we have been struggling with in learning analytics, like adoption, uh, how to integrate the voice of students, and all these questions that emerge. So, um, I also got some questions from the Padlet, which I thought were very important, and they touch on 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 some of these um, issues. So, for example, how do we actually uh, have a, a long-term human-centered learning analytics study that produces actually something, right? And so I'm going to present one example, very fresh. Um, or for example, how can we um, involve the students to design something for them if they don't know about pedagogy, which is some one of the classic um, arguments that we've been having um, when we talk about this, you know, the, the topic about expertise. So we are going to talk precisely about that. That's one of the key challenges. Or how to we involve teachers if they they are busy, right? How do we involve them in the design? And, and that's another critical challenge. But just following up with this preamble of why this is important, it seems it's important because also in the keynote on LAC 23, um, Yvonne Rogers was invited, uh, which to me was, was amazing because she's coming from human computer interactions. I know her from my background, human computer interactions, since I was doing my PhD, and she was talking about pretty much the importance of human centeredness in learning analytics tools. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and at the same time, there were their voices, um, this fantastic piece by Charles Lang and co-authors, where, where he also questions like, okay, what, what do we mean by human centeredness? Uh, which I also recommend that piece to be read, um, which, because it's important to read all the different voices about human centeredness. Um, so what is human-centered learning analytics? I feel like this is an evolving definition. This is the one um, I propose in, in this piece, uh, just recent, recently published in, in the Journal of Learning, learning Letters, um, which is inspired, and I need to acknowledge that, on the work um, I did for the human-centered learning analytics workshop this year, um, inspired as well by the intention of the learning analytics conference to be focusing on trustworthiness. And that trustworthiness makes a connection with human-centered AI, which is another area outside learning analytics where uh, there is also the intention of bringing human-centeredness and, and, and not just co-design or not just designing with people, but many other concepts that are important to consider. Um, so, so, well, I'm going to leave this here, but the idea is to develop trustworthy, trustworthy and reliable systems, right? We even don't have here uh, in this definition uh, designing with or co-designing or doing participatory design because that's kind of assumed, but we're going to talk about, about that, right? Uh, why, why is it assumed? Is it just because is, we use the word human-centeredness or is maybe because to really know the intentions, preferences, interests, and values of people, we cannot make assumptions. We cannot uh, wear, try to wear the shoes for other people, right? So we will be back to, to that initial image that I showed at the beginning, not designing, assuming that people needs have certain needs and intentions and preferences without really knowing. Um, but I'm just stepping forward too much. So let's just dive a little bit into human centeredness before I start to talk about the um, challenges per se. Um, just as um, 
um, just to showcase a little bit of the work where these challenges emerge. Um, because in the, the piece is very short, so I didn't have enough space to, to talk. Well, we have been doing this work here and there, and, and we learned that these are the challenges. So I wanted to provide that kind of background. And um, some of the initial work that, that we started with, um, uh, with Carlos Prieto Alvarez, he was a former student who brought this knowledge as well about using design thinking, co-design to really involve teachers, learners, researchers, developers, all the different stakeholders in design process. And may, 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 many of you, I'm sure, are, are familiar with design thinking. But the main idea of design thinking is that there are some phases, like first you need to understand. And then maybe once we understand the problem, then we, we move to creation um, of prototypes and then also delivering and starting to with this iterative process. Um, but the important thing to me, the design thinking is that it's a double, uh, is there are multiple triangles if you can see here. This is the, the most important thing that is, is understanding that design requires this divergent step and before we go into a convergence. So we really understand in divergent stages, what is the problem and what is the design space? And then we synthesize and converge. Okay, this is what we're gonna do. Okay, how do we do it? Okay, we, we have these different ways. Oh, dashboard maybe is one way, but if we originally say, oh, our project is to build a dashboard, we cannot do this because we already converge. There is no openness for divergence. And, and obviously there are limits, but this is to me the main important thing, thinking about divergence and convergence design. Uh, regardless of how strictly design thinking is followed, I feel like this is a good inspiration that then we can appropriate in our projects. Um, at least not to start with, we're gonna build at the dashboard, that's already opening the design space and the opportunities to deliver something that maybe is gonna be more helpful in the long term. And how do we, how we have been doing this? So this has been work that has been going on for several years in different projects where we talk about understanding in design there is a, a whole area which is called this generative design. It's not generative AI, it's before generative AI, generative tools, generative tools for creation. But it has the same connotation. There are tools for ideating, for creating new ideas, as simple as using card sorting, brainstorming. Um, in this case, we were using with teachers, um, card sorting with voting and to understand what are the problems and and we understood that just a fraction of problems were learn analytics problems. So one of, I mean, we then we even didn't go on with this project because we were like, we're not forcing learn analytics because it's only covering 10 or 15 percent of the problems. The other problems are are are, are others. So um, this was very interesting exercise. We had other projects that were more oriented towards learning analytics, different tools could be used in this way. We use learning data journeys, which is inspired on user journeys, um, which are used for mapping how people interact with websites, for example, and what is a successful, like buying something online successfully and, and then designing for that. So we brought that into uh, learning to map those learning journeys and find the opportunities to use data and create analytics. So then we could go to the creation stage and it was like, okay, now for this project, we need to create something. There's an opportunity. And now we can start converging and creating something, inviting teachers and students to prototype and bring in those journeys. And then, okay, what can we do? Very, very low fidelity prototypes as you can see, um, but then that we could create stronger projects um, and Carlos as well, one of our students, uh, he also came up with this idea of scaffolding. And now in Learn Analytics, there are so many card-based uh, decks that are facilitating this kind of conversations. Um, the unique thing, well, what I really like about Carlos' project was uh, that he put together in the same table teachers, students, and also developers. So the idea was for all the stakeholders to sit at the same table and so many things emerge from, from that. Um, 
And, and we have been also delivering things. And this is one of the first questions in the Padlet that what can you show one example of, you know, that where, where human-centered design has been done with teachers and, and the students. And actually we deliver something, I'm gonna go there. And we started with prototypes until we have been delivering things now um, in, in, in a larger scale. So this leads to the first challenge. The paper is titled Four Challenges. So I'm gonna go through each of those challenges. And the first challenge is phrases following. The education stakeholders participating in these kind of projects may be highly motivated, exceptional individuals, such as high achieving students and teachers, right? And that, that was one of the second questions in the part that was, um, yeah, how do you convince teachers to take some of their precious time to start working on design? And, and that's, the, that's a problem because some teachers are going to be willing to do it. Some students are going to be willing to do it, but often they're going to be the most highly motivated. And that's not the best way to design something, especially if we want to create learn analytics tools, especially for students that may be disadvantaged, that may be going through challenges. And if we don't know those challenges, we are definitely not going to get that information from the, uh, the students that have the time for designing, for example. So, so that's a, a big problem. And there is no one simple solution, obviously. Um, but definitely that's the problem or the challenge of skew representation in the participation of learn analytics design. So there are some potential strategies, things that we can learn from the existing literature and existing uh, tools that, that are there that we can start to use, put to the test in our educational and data intensive, intensive scenarios and maybe come up with new ideas. And that's, that, that's why I made at the beginning, we don't have, I'm not gonna provide proven solutions because we are struggling with the same challenges. And I feel like the idea would be to, to start working on identifying these challenges and start working together as a community. Um, potential strategies exist. The one that is really interesting um, is designing solutions for underrepresented users. Um, but but like really taking taking that as the goal. So kind of like, and there is, this is documented that I provide um, in the paper, I provide another reference as well before, uh, besides Nielsen. And, and in the area of design, he has been shown that if we design for the underrepresented populations, let's say um, the minority, of students based on on some um, on, on some characteristic that we identify, for example, the students that cannot uh, that uh, that uh, cannot uh, complete the first uh, part of the, the assessments, for example, which maybe is going to be ten percent. So if we design for them a tool that works for them, the chances that the same tool or the end product. Um, that, that ends up being designed for them, that, that it can work to for other students, for the rest of the population are higher than if we design for the 90% of the population, most likely the, the resulting tool is not may not gonna work on the 10%. So this may help us to then find uh, the, the strategies or put together strategies to engage with that 10% designing for them. And if we can solve and address their problems, it's most likely we're gonna be addressing the problems of, of the wider population. That's really interesting, that's well-documented, and it's something that potentially we can start doing. I, I, we haven't done it because we've been working on other projects because there's so many things that, that can come up, but it will be very interested in if there is any conversation, any opportunity, for anyone um, that says, oh, they have this problem, let's, let's work, work together, that would be awesome. Um, and there are also design toolkits like the Cambridge Inclusive Design Kit. It's not that comprehensive, but it is very interesting because it provides tools for engaging precisely in, in these scenarios. Um, and I'm gonna jump 
to an applied scenario. So I've been talking about, oh, this is not the kind of a scenario I'm working. We're working on this scenario. This is one of the um, ongoing projects, very exciting, is in the area of healthcare. And some of you may know me that I've been working in the area of multimodal learning analytics for a while. Um, but to me, it's more like working in scenarios that involve face-to-face -face interaction, because I just really love that. And since I was doing my PhD as well, I was always working in classrooms, more, more recently working also on how the teacher moves in the classroom, how people interact with the teacher. And in these scenarios, first time I saw it, it was like, wow, this is amazing. So many things are happening. Uh, people are moving. These are four nurses working on a full immersive scenario. They don't know what's going on. They need to figure out, find evidence. They have four patients. There are different variations of the scenario, but the idea is they enter into a room. It's like a skate room. They don't know what's going on. They need to figure it out. And they put into practice all kinds of skills from knowing how to move in the hospital to how to communicate, put, in, put together and put into practice protocols. So all that knowledge the uh, from healthcare, but also teamwork is just like super complex. So many things can, can happen as well. And um, so I've been working in this area um, and we enhance this with uh, different sensors, depending on the scenarios. We have an ongoing project now for, for three years um, where we build human, a human-centered design project uh, to engage with, with the actual teachers and students. And, and, and that's why I brought this as an example, um, because it's very complex and we needed human-centeredness. Otherwise, we would be just creating cool tools that no one is gonna use. Um, and it's, it's very uh, complicated to create. So we want to maximize opportunities. So we use microphones, location sensors, physiological wristbands, and uh, videos sometimes as well. Um, this is what, what they wear. And obviously there are also all kinds of equipment. So you can get data about even how they, they check the pulse of the mannequin. <clears throat> this is really cool. Really complex because if I know that you have been working in different areas. So some of you have been working, for example, with audio, and you know that just working with audio is a whole thing. Um, localization sensors is, is a bit more esoteric. Um, not many are working with indoor positioning, but it's really cool information. Um, and especially when it starts to be complemented with audio, for example. And now that we have a generative AI, automated transcription on the go, is just is just bringing the analysis capabilities to the next level. So we are able, for example, and, and automatically detect um, what are the things that the teachers are saying using uh, automated coding. Uh, so this is the more like the sophistication of the AI. So it starts to, to be very complex. Um, and also we can use um, a computer vision to, to track people and actions. So what I'm saying is there's lots of complexity in analysis, but the question is how do we create something that actually helps teachers that teachers can use? The advantage of this scenario is that teachers have this signature pedagogy. So after the simulations, they, they need to reflect. They need to guide a reflection with the students. So the students reflect actually not. So the teacher guides the reflection. In the debrief, similar to other teamwork scenarios, to other kind of trainings um, uh, that are done in different areas. Anyway, so the idea was this is a great opportunity we detected a few years ago about well, this is a great case for using learning analytics because teachers usually use just the memory um, to just they, they write some notes and then they need to lead a whole debrief for almost an hour. So longer than the actual learning scenario. Um, and there was an opportunity to bring evidence that then the teacher can use to, to also guide that reflection and also to help students to, to see, see themselves in the mirror. It's like, oh, all this was happening. Um, so we have been designing this. Um, this is the, just fresh from the oven. This is um, an actual tool that we call it is an orchestration of the multimodal learning analytics tool. This is in a tablet and the teachers co-designed this by themselves. We actually struggled to convince them not to follow our path. 
we follow like uh, act strict co-design so it was they need to make the decisions as well and this is a tablet that they use to to then send some visualizations to the to the screen in the actual classroom and then they can use that to facilitate that reflection and this is um, amazing work that was mainly led by Vanessa Cheveria and uh, as a postdoc in our in our lab and and students and and that, that we're doing a, an intensive work. And the cool thing is that in the first two years of this project, we were dedicated mostly to doing data collection and, and we were doing the design for the teachers. But then the last year we said, no, let's do full co-design and the teachers became our partners. We were having meetings every week or every two weeks for several months and there were design sessions. So not, not just one off design session, it was, several iterations and they were designing different parts of the system i'm not gonna go that deep into them into all the different features this is just the more flashy one with the visualizations but they also designed the whole socio-technical system so that includes also their practices so they also design the practices around the use of the visualizations which is something that we shouldn't ignore because otherwise we just design a tool what happens with the signing the the whole was well, that's part of the learning design, right? So so design involves both things that are in the visualization, but also designing the whole context, designing all the the the, the epistemic side, the okay, how are we gonna use this visualization when? Oh, I need also to make notes. So you can see on the right there is some notes there. So there's another tool they use, and and everything became like a whole system where learning analytics is the actual tool is, is just part of the whole ecosystem. So it was very interesting. And obviously that brings lots of challenges. And one, the second challenge and that's, that's the natural flow is the second challenge is how do we put your, your how can we put ourselves in the shoes of others? That's really hard. Uh, so we were saying at the beginning so designers often commonly cannot really understand what teachers and students really need. We may make assumptions, and this starts to touch on one of the several questions that um, we discuss in the HCLA workshops and what, one or two that were in the pilot, which is, and there even papers about them, is like, okay, how can we involve students in the design of a learning analytics tool if they don't know about pedagogy? That's true and completely valid. And they don't know about AI, or they know, but, but not with limited knowledge, you know, maybe depending on what kind of students we are working with, healthcare students, we need to even explain to them what is analytics, right? Um, so the same with teachers, we can uh, have teachers that they really know about pedagogy, but maybe they don't know all the possibilities enabled by the, the, the AI and power tools and analytics. We also can involve uh, the developers. And we have been having developers, research assistants, that they don't know anything about pedagogy. So they also need to provide their view, but there, there are also limitations and so on. We can, we can talk about any kind of educational stakeholder. Also, if we start to, to think about different projects, there are also decision makers and, and so on. So the, what I discussed in the paper is bringing this language of um, in HCI, which is uh, bringing the idea of life experience. And, and actually someone asked, well, it's not just experience. Well, yeah, but that's how it's identified in the literature. So it can be easier to find it. If you just type experience, it's gonna be hard to find the right literature. But if you find, if you look for life experience, there is it's, it's conceptualized. So is the personal experience, decisions and knowledge gained from these experiences? So then the response to those questions about how can we involve students if they don't know about what is good for them, if they don't know about what, you know, what is the best pedagogical approach or analytics, maybe it's because we are oriented that question from the wrong angle, because we are asking them the questions that are not coming, not being informed by their life experiences. So the idea is to know that each stakeholder can contribute with their own expertise, their own life experience. So just 
changing that paradigm shift, maybe can open up different different ways to, to approach them students and, and teachers. And, and this is true. Like we we're facing this this problem all the time when we talk with students, especially healthcare. Um, because uh, sometimes there's also the idea that we need to uh, train our people, right? Train people on uh, on AI or training in pedagogy, which may be the case. That if this is possible, let's do it. That would be really good. And actually, in co-design, that that's an, an approach upskilling our co-designers, so upskilling our team. Uh, we we need to also make uh, be aware that that's hard, that's costly. And that, for example, uh, especially students that uh, put there in the title, teachers and students should be considered non-data experts. Well, some teachers are, uh, depending on the field, but many are not. And definitely students even struggle with information visualizations. This is uh, one piece or, or, or other um, papers that have been put to the test how students can understand simple visualizations that are shown by teachers in the classes even being scaffolded by teachers and they are like, I don't understand. And um, in our dashboards have this kind of visualization. So that's a whole story and, and that connects with also my interest in data storytelling. Um, but but we need to acknowledge and that there is evidence showing that students at least are not going to, to tell you too much about, oh, I want this data visualization in this way because they are not data experts. We can help them to, to get the basics, definitely. Um, but maybe what we need is other kind of stakeholders that bring that expertise to complement the lack of expertise. Um, and, and the third challenge, kind of related, uh, non-data experts are unlikely to be aware of the implications of learning analytics design choices, right? So this suggests uh, the need for new methods, particularly tailored for teachers and students. Uh, we, they, that's why I was talking about human-centered learning analytics. At the moment, we are borrowing uh, the knowledge from human-centered design practices. Um, but maybe there is something unique about learning analytics, about the educational system. One potential unique <laughs> aspect is that, especially for the students, if we involve students, in the design process, we know that the students are always a moving target. They are always evolving. They are not static. They are not, I mean, if we are going to create a learn analytics tool for first year students and we uh, co-design with first year students, we're not designing with them. I mean, we're designing with them, but they are not going to be the users. We are designing for the next generation. And maybe the next generation is different because also the world changes and the needs of students change and the kind of tools they use and the kind of problems change. So that will be different um, compared to, let's say, designing in a community and we design with, with people and they are going to be the final users. Uh, so maybe there are uniqueness, unique uh, aspects in education. Um, but in any case, to potentially overcome this challenges um, of lack of expertise in, especially in AI and analytics, which is one of the main things that, that we are gonna face, is collaborating with data and human data interaction experts. So to bring that expertise, to, to actually potentially uh, bring HCI as a core part of learning analytics as well. Um, and, and I know that I have said this once in a forum in, in LAC, I remember, and sometimes people remember, um, that once I said, oh, I can see learn analytics is like a kind of HCI sub community. You know, if if we want to uh, close the loop and design is one part of it and we create interfaces, that sounds like HCI. Okay, maybe it's not, but um, there is lots of commonalities and we can learn a lot from it, I guess. And um, I've seen this in all this work. This is not my work. This is a uh, awesome work by Ken Holstein. Um, during his PhD, he um, came from ideation using generative tools to then ideate for the future. Uh, and I think this is going to become real sometimes, a dashboard with a augmented reality uh, lens, maybe even from next year, once we get uh, that Apple vision. Um, um, but anyway, whatever we create, um, 
I, I always come back to this um, paper by Pierre Trunikin. Um, I know that it was centered on CSEL, but I, I love thinking that how every time we are doing design of a new tool of learning analytics is, okay, learners are not to be seen as passive beneficiaries of a superior control entity. And this is so powerful. And it precisely brings this idea of power, right? When we create something for someone and there is power because there are decisions. Who makes the decisions? Um, in in educational uh, sector, there is lots of uh, power relationships, of course, right? So it's really important to acknowledge those, to know them, and acknowledge as well that that's a challenge in designing. The power dynamics among researchers, designers, users, other stakeholders are going to influence the decision making. It's really hard to give. And that was the third question in the Padlet, how to give the design decision to someone who is not expert in, le expert in learn analytics. Or in a situation where we have a learn analytics student, PhD student, let's say, and I can see some are in the audience. Um, how are you gonna you know, have the luxury of, of giving the decision of your PhD uh, to someone who doesn't know learn analytics? So um, it's really hard to, to release that power because we have power as well as, as researchers, right? But here as well, it taps on all their other relationships of power. For example, in Carlos' um, research, when he sat he, he sat together with teachers and students, there's already a big relationship of power. What a teacher, what, what if the student wants to contradict, contradict the teacher? Uh, maybe nothing's gonna come up from that situation. So there is this is a um, a complex um, situation. I know that um, Lou Lawrence uh, is a researcher in um, United States. She's working in this area. So it's, it would be really good as well to um, start building that collaboration around um, how the relationships of power influence the decision making in, in learning analytics. And, and we do it probably unconsciously all the time. We do it in our lab. And the first time that we tried to avoid it was in this project, long project within healthcare, where the teachers started to make decisions. And we knew that some decisions um, were leading towards something that was gonna fail. We, we work on convincing and, and being um, persuasive, but without imposing it, because our research as well was, okay, we cannot impose it. We cannot impose our will because otherwise we are not um, doing what we preach, right? And and we put it to the test. And just to make that story short, what we decided to do was okay. The teachers did make some decisions. We may be aware that some decisions are wrong. For example, we know that in data visualization principles, we need to provide uh, details on demand. So what happens if the teachers don't? You know, contradict that principle. We know it's going to fail because we're researchers and we know about information visualization. But what we decided to do is to come to a middle point where, where there was a if there was a drastic issue, we would just highlight it. Um, but still, we would listen to the teacher and we would follow things even though we were 50 50% 50 uh, aware that something was not going to work. So we followed their way. And what we did was some bringing another kind of approach, which is called this um, design in use, um, which is, as the name suggests, designing as people use the tools. And there's whole theories in ergonomics that explain how both the psychological aspects of the practice, like the human aspect, evolves, and, and then we can evolve as well the tool. So we ended up, and it's, it's really hard because we needed to make changes on the go. And depending on the project, that may be feasible. It may not be feasible, but we managed to do it. And then we ended up with a design extended during the use. There are four intense weeks of using the tool. Now the multimodal tool is being used as usual, as, as if it would be Moodle. It's not a research experiment. It's part of the actual uh, learning situation. It's, all the students need to use it. Probably is one of the first projects that have reached that point. But the only way to do it was to let the, the teachers to make the mistakes and let the teachers to, okay, you own it, it's yours. 
and um, and it was very chaotic. But in the end, the the tool was so strong that now it's a tool that they want to keep using in the in the next uh, uh, in the next editions of the because they have these four weeks of intense simulations before the students go to to the real world. So they make mistakes safely and then they can go. So um, that's a trade-off. That was a very interesting trade-off for this kind of um, yeah complex scenarios. And just fine, just to start finalizing because I'm aware that um, we would like to to have a bit of time to for questions. Um, be mindful about the use of words participatory design, co-design, co-creation. When you use it in your papers, just just check what what they involve and and if the project actually. Um, is about those because they are so, it's so complex that each of them tap on different literature. And that's something that we have been observing for some time, especially when editing these special issues is like how easy, and, we, and probably in our lab, we have done it as, as well in the past, using these words um, very easily. Ah, oh, we're co-designing, but are we really? Um, and, and then also to start to wrap up, um, what has been important in, in our projects has been um, understanding what is the role of the facilitator, which is precisely about that figure who does not impose preferences on a project, which is really, super, really hard. And I'm really bad at that. Um, uh, but the ideas, and that's what actually for this last project, the leader had to be someone else, because I was like, okay, no, I'm going to impose information visualization stuff because um, just treat me as another voice, but not as someone who can make decisions. So the facilitator had to have a role. It was not like we are the researchers and we made the decisions. We had to have a facilitator role, which in this case was a postdoc and a PhD student. And they were leading the people. They were leading also the research team. So that's really important to separate these relationships of power. So a facilitator has a specific um, role and actually this is documented as well, you know, it, it leads, provides guidance, provides scaffolds, and, and it can mediate between all the different forces, even within our own research team. So that's another um, potential strategy. Um, so that's it. Um, I think I spoke more than what I expected. Um, maybe there's some time for some questions. I see two in the Q&A. I think, Roberto, if you stop sharing, we should be able to get like a gallery view up. And then if people want to jump in and ask their questions, we can do. Just you raise your hands and we'll try to do some sort of first in best dress. But I did notice a good question in the in the Q&A from uh, from Yanis. And I'm going to try and paraphrase it, Yanis. If I get it wrong, jump in and correct me. But you were talking about skewed representation of participants. And that brings concerns about scalability of HCA, HCLA. What insights do you have on how we can deal with this these issues of scalability and validity when even the participants in the process don't have a consistent understanding of their own mind? They keep changing their mind. Did I get that roughly right? Yeah, that's that's valid. <laughs> hey, Janice. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I thought like there were like two questions. So if, what happened if the stakeholders change their mind and also does the skew representation? Um, yeah, they are closely related. Closely yeah. related, yeah. Um, well, with skew representation, um, we have been that's a challenge that we haven't addressed. So we get whatever this whatever students are willing to, to participate in a project so far. Uh, we haven't had a project where we can actually target that group. As I was mentioning, uh, if you have a scenario where maybe it's you know, more a, a population level rather than a single cohort level, um, we haven't had the opportunity to identify what is the, the population that is underrepresented. Um, so, so in that sense, for example, our students is, what we do is um, because we also have the ethics protocols and all of that. So you know, students need to, and in practicality, you know, without also practicalities that then we need to differentiate between research and design. 
designers sometimes have more flexibility because they don't need to go through an ethics protocol, for example. So they can just simply try to engage with people. But we cannot, as researchers, try to engage with people. It's just not possible, not at all. So uh, at least here in Australia, I guess in Europe is even harder, but we cannot even get the the particular, like we cannot send an email or anything. So it's really hard to do it in research. Um, it would be very interesting to see what strategies we can develop as a community for doing that, I guess. Um, and the one about people change their mind, oh, so many examples we have. Um, yeah, because we are having these weekly meetings with teachers. They were changing their mind. Sometimes it was related as well with the challenge of the power. So we had these five main teachers and we were meeting with them. It was a, it was a whole group and there was other people coming in and, and, and out from the, we call it co-design group because that was a, that's the idea of the co-design group. They, they follow up week after week. And there was a, there's a chief investigator or a chief teacher. Well, this is no investigator, it's a chief teacher with more experience. Um, and, and, and there were different voices around. And this is very interesting because um, we could observe how, how the teachers were navigating from one decision to the other. And sometimes this depended on who was in the meetings and, and just navigating of that is complex, but it's really interesting. And in the end, then that's the role of the facilitator is to, okay, there's this contradiction and this contradiction, what are we gonna do? And with, that's the way we were resolving it. So our solution was, we need a facilitator or two in our case. And the facilitator needs to look at that and also to resolve the contradictions between different types of stakeholders, which was um, external learn analytics researchers. So in this case is a collaborator from another institution and our, ourselves bringing different expertise. So the facilitator was, was the key to resolve those conflicts. But I feel in those conflicts, there was lots of knowledge gain. And, and in the end, that was, that was the richness of the process. So, so it, was, it was really good to have those different views. And we learned as well uh, about the relationship of power a lot. Picking up on that, there's another question in the uh, Q&A from Sanika. And again, Sanika, if I get this wrong, um, just jump in and correct me. But Sanika asks, and I'm gonna tweak it slightly, are there any specific qualifications or expertise we should be considering when we're selecting our stakeholder panels? How do we get that balance right in the panel selection? Or I suppose, what's the risks of if we get it wrong as well? Yeah, but the, in I see all, another one, which is about the stage you know, on which design should be HCD. Um, yeah, the, the right balance. I, I think we do also need to be practical, like in our case, we want to have all the stakeholders in the same table. That's our aim. In practice, it's hard. Um, we have lacked the students several times. We had to interview students afterwards, and that's not really co-design. It's like, it's like, okay, if students are here and, and we need to interview them when we have the chance, but then um, they are not sitting with the teachers and that can create this imbalance as well in, perce in, in perception. So. I mean, I think we need to be practical, aim for bringing as many voices. So at least if we recognize, okay, we're gonna build a, te uh, a teacher's tool. And that has been one, one of our projects. We build a teacher's tool and we involve students in the process. And we were asked when we had a, uh, a publication, why, why do you bring students? Well, because the teachers were looking at the representations of the students and for us, that was important to know if the, for the students that was valid, a valid representation of themselves. Um, so I would say we need to bring all the stakeholders as possible, but well, if it's not possible, then we don't. Um, and then the regarding the stage of the study should be HCD. I, I think um, uh, that I cannot be prescriptive, you know, like we sometimes do stuff that are not HD. Uh, human-centered design, um, depending on, on what. I feel like once we are talking about about the interface, we should. Sometimes um, there's a literature review we're working on at the moment, and one of the findings is that 
human-centered design obviously is usually applied when there is an interface, but also there is some cases in which HDD could be used when working to create the algorithms that then are going to be used to make automated decisions. Because some automated decisions don't have an interface per se, but they can have an impact, like even more impact than an interface because they make automated actions. And that's the interface. So it's very risky to say when, I think hopefully, ideally all our learning analytics research should be, because that's the, also the aim of um, human-centered AI is to think that the algorithms are going to be there everywhere, are already there, but they're going to be even more pervasive. And, and, and we're going to be interacting without noticing. And if we don't create them based on human-centered design principles or human-centered AI principles, we don't know what are the consequences and people are not going to know and we can end up doing things that are not done with integrity. Okay, a question that appeared in the chat, and I think I'm going to paraphrase it slightly, it comes from Addison Lawyer, and I forgot that wrong, I apologize. Um, we're asking the question, wondering where teacher-focused learning analytics becomes different from learner-focused learning analytics in this whole human-centered design. Do we need, I'm guessing the question is, do we need two parallel processes? Um, well, that's very interesting. Um, maybe it's for a long, I know I'm conscious about the time as well, but um, as that's like a longer conversation, I guess it's a paradigmatic. But I think in our case, as the example I just mentioned, um, we have involved students in the teacher facing dashboards and the design of them. And it has been really good because then we know that the students say like, oh, this, this is not me. And um, we recently as well, this dashboard we designed with the teachers, we showed it to the students for the purpose to design an interface for them. So to adapt that to, into something that can be used without having the teacher for them to do other tasks. And that was also very productive. So I guess it depends on the project. I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't put that barrier between learner phasing, teacher phasing, because it's a whole system. And if we start to divide that way, we are losing track that we're talking about whole system. If, a, if there is a teacher, there is a student, right? So all teacher facing dashboards involve students. If there's a student, well, there are some pedagogical paradigms and we were trying to remove teachers, maybe that would be the situation. But as far as I know, or at least in the projects where I work, there's always a teacher, there's always a facilitator. So I wouldn't separate them. So it's always consider it from multiple viewpoints, but it's one system. Yeah. And yeah. learning designers as well. Maybe there's not the same people as the teachers. They should be included as well. Uh, we could go on forever on different perspectives. Yeah. <laughs> there is one more question in the Q&A from Penny. Um, she likes the story about um, allowing the ex the accident to happen, even though you knew it could be a potential car crash with the learning analytics and the... And the uh, um, data visualization but the question is about at what point or do you even take existing designs for learning analytics in, that are actually out there in practice and use it as inspiration for your new design process are you always starting from a blank slate or do you start from we have this what could we do with it penny if i've got that wrong just jump john, in and make john, make it better john just the idea that you might have used existing designs. Hi, Roberto. You might have used existing designs as to, as part of, of of that code of working with the teachers. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I think this same approach can be used for redesigning things. So not to start all the time from oh, what are your needs? Because if you start to to from that level as we have in one project, we will realize, okay, this project is not learning analytics. <laughs> Let's try to solve other problems. Oh, that's an education problem. Um, so many times we need to start from either um, like a notion of, okay, this is the boundary. This is the problem we are addressing is where we start to diverge, but we converge into something based on some previous educational theory, um, studies, a situation, um, but I guess your question as well taps on um, potentially learn analytics patterns that we need to start putting together. I'm, I'm not aware, maybe someone is working on that, um, like common solutions. 
Um, so that would be awesome. <laughs> It'd be we lovely to get maybe. a toolbox. <laughs> Henry, does that sort of answer what you were getting at? Perfect, thanks. Um, well, there is one, while we were talking, another question just came come in from Jane. Roberta, I know we're running quite late, but are you willing to answer one more? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jane's asking that there are many different tools and methods used in design thinking for testing assumptions, um, say, using the post-it notes, the risk matrix, voting, speed, boards, etc. Based on your experience, are there some specific ones that you would recommend and ones that just didn't work as we'd expect? Well, that's a massive question. Uh, we use, and I can quickly share my screen again, because um, we this is, I just prepared for that question. <laughs> it's an excellent question. Um, so we use this uh, resource, it's very useful. Um, is the Universal Methods of Design book. Uh, I think we use a newer ed edition that even has more tools. And, and there are so many tools. Um, and we have been using um, different ones. I mean, I, 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 would, I wouldn't be able to say um, one works better than the others because it depends on the project. We have been using eye tracking, for example. Um, we have been using the most common things like car sorting, case studies, um concept mapping uh yeah many that we haven't used crowdsourcing we haven't used um there is so many this is just one book there are so many other guides um i would say that it is more about trying to find out and really knowing like getting this book would be a good start like for us we have a few copies here the students use them and and then depending on the context then the the selection of of the tool is going to be more, um, uh, yeah, an, easy, an easier uh, way to, to select the tool based on the on the context and and seeing oh this is the tool this is why it does. Um, so it's more is yeah we need to upskill ourselves in design myself as well I don't have a design background I just like passion from the human center from the human the HCI the human computer interaction um, background I have during my PhD but. Um, I, I wish I, I could have the time as well to take design courses because it's so useful. Hmm. Well, thank you for that. Thank you, Jane. I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, just jump on and correct it. Um, but I'm going to say thank you to everybody for being here tonight. Um, we had 38 people in the room at one point. I know, well, well, I say tonight, but I know for some people it's very early in the morning and for some it's mid-afternoon. Um, Again, I'm going to point out just above my to the right of my, to my right ear, there should be a QR code that will take you to learningletters.org, which is the website of our journal. We're interested in continuing this sort of conversation. Journals used to be and still are in many cases a good place to actually have a conversation around the research and events like this are a way to build on those papers those short papers those quick published papers and so we encourage submit your research here and it is a platinum open source journal so no charges for publishing no charges for, for reading it's there and we have these wonderful events on board as well so and as i've noticed um negan is in the in the um room and Florence are in the room they are also the some of the editors on the journal as well so they've just unmuted to wave their face and thank you Roberta for uh, contributing to this session thank you so much for everyone thank you so much John Negging yeah have a good evening day afternoon <laughs> yep and if we don't see you have a good morning good afternoon and good night yeah <laughs> I think that's something close to the line yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. So much, Roberta. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's Pablo. And